Have I got this thing turned around backwards? Is that what's going on here? Because um, that's a maybe. whole lot brighter. <laughs> Best snap I've ever heard. Oh, thanks. <laughs> You're a pr practice. You're welcome. Can See I unplug this? Yeah, yes. It's a conspiracy! Cool. We good. Uh, we are rolling. All right, cool. Um, welcome back, everyone, to It's a Conspiracy. This is the podcast where we lay out the beliefs behind select conspiracy theories, alternative accounts, legends, myth, more. Um, this is our extra special, and uh, we are going to talk about some music stuff today. And uh, we've extra got a very special. Yeah, we've got a very special guest with Richard Inman today. So it's, it's good to have you, man. Yeah. Thanks. It's good to be here. <laughs> and we're, uh, we're recording live from uh, uh, the Acoustic Music Shop on White Ave. Right. And uh, they're nice enough to let us use their acoustic room and take over for a little while. And live on location. Cool. Uh, on the one hour when everybody's going to want to buy a fiddle and a mandolin. <laughs> we will be in this room. Pretty funny. We got set up, got all our stuff loaded in here, and, and Rod was like, I haven't sold a mandolin in weeks, and like within minutes of us setting up our stuff, like there was people like lining up to check out the mandolins. That's how it goes. Mm -hmm. Said he should have us in here every week. He would sell so many more <laughs> yeah. mandolins. Um, so one of my favorite uh, songwriters, and and actually Richard and I have talked about this guy quite a bit, is uh, Towns Van Zant. Um, and one of the things I didn't know about this guy was that, uh, and I'll provide all of the information in the episode description, but he, he. Um, he did this thing where he was from, first of all, he was from an extremely wealthy family, like a billionaire Texas family. And uh, I didn't know that. And it was, it was really cool coming across this stuff. Like it's not, he's, he's a, a self-made man for sure, but like in the music world, but he, uh, he came from a very, very affluent family. Um, and his, uh, he scored extremely high on his SATs going into university. So he was, it's hard to say like people throw around the word genius and it it's a really hard thing to measure uh and there's debate over actual genius like whether it's a thing or not but he's one of these people that his just his academic record was incredible um went to university kind of stopped going to classes started suffering from depression and then every once in a while he would show up um out of his room and he'd be like hey, everybody come to my place let's have a party and uh, he had this huge party one night and he's leaning on the railing outside of his uh his dorm room and he's like, hey, guys, do you think it'd be kind of funny if I, like, fell down, like, four stories here? And everybody's like, yeah, huh, that'd, be, that'd be funny, all right. And he, uh, he actually, like, just let himself kind of fall off of the, 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 the railing, fell down four stories in a building, uh, landed on his back, and, uh, and everyone's like, what? <laughs> okay. So they all ran down thinking he was going to be dead, and uh, he wasn't. Um, and he was fine. He stood up and everybody, apparently what he said was that everybody checking on him to make sure he was okay was actually uh, a little more like that. That was more invasive to him than like falling down and, and landing. Um, shortly after that, his parents uh, were like, okay, there's some, there's some issues here. So he was in to uh, something here and I've, I've got a list of it here called it's, I'm not exactly sure what it's called. It's called, uh, or I'm not exactly sure what it is. It's called heavy insulin therapy. So he did three months of this really intense therapy. Um, and one of the side effects was he still continued to suffer from depression for the rest of his life, but his uh, long-term memory was totally messed. So the funny thing was, is that if you like in his movie and in a few of his concerts, and I think maybe on, on his old quarter album, there's moments where he talks about different songs being the first song that he ever wrote. So he'd be like, oh, this is the first song I ever wrote. And he said that about a bunch of different songs. And uh, what's that movie called? Heartworn that's, Highways. Heart, uh, Heartworn Highways. That's, yeah. a, that's a great movie. That, it's a, it's a great movie. That's one movie. Uh, the, the actual documentary is called Be Here to Love Me. Thank you. That's what I was trying yeah. to think of. This. I knew there was two names for it. And there's the scene where he's playing and there's that like nice old guy in the background who starts crying. Yeah. Like It's really intense. And uh, right when he's introducing that song, he says, this is the first song I ever wrote or something along those lines. Um, and, uh, the thing is, is he, he had such a massive, something was wrong with his brain after the treatment and he had this massive memory loss. So it might've been the first song he ever wrote, but I mean, he made that claim about a couple of different songs. <laughs> so it's hard to say. If I saw that nowadays, it, that would make a good bit. You just say that in front of every song you play. <laughs> this is the first song I ever this wrote. Is, uh, this song is, uh, this one's the first song I ever wrote. Yeah. 
That is... I'm going to try that on Saturday on my next show. <laughs> and we'll be doing mostly covers on Saturday, so it'll be extra good. <laughs> Are you playing a show on Saturday? Yeah, the Hellboys are playing at the Boot Scootin' Boogie Hall. All right on, man. I don't know if we ever talk about that. Charlie has a band. I think yeah. Yeah, the three of us work as musicians. This we're is all musicians. This is the first time we ever really kind of broached the musician thing on the podcast. Is that a... No. There. There we go. I'm going to forget all the words to this. I'll give it a try, though. Sometimes I don't know this dirty road is taking me. Sometimes I can't even see the reason why. I guess I'll keep a gambling, lots of booze and lots of rambling. It's easier than just waiting around to die. One time friends, I had a ma, I even had a pa He beat her with a bell once cause she cried She told him to take care of me, headed down to Tennessee It's easier than just waiting around to die Friend said he knew where some easy money was. We robbed a man, and brother did we fly. The boss he got up to me and drug me back to Muskogee. It's been too long years, I'm waiting around to die. And now I'm out of prison. Got me a friend at last And he don't drink or steal or cheat or lie Well his name is Codeine It's the nicest thing I've ever seen Together we're just gonna wait around to die Together we're gonna wait around to die Towns Van Zandt, yeah. It was the first song he ever wrote. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're, you're a big Towns Van Zandt fan, Richard. Yeah, I don't know what you'd call it anymore, but I'm pretty learned about the subject, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, do you think, do you think he was one of these guys that had, uh, like there's, they talk about uh, depression and this therapy having a huge impact on him and kind of like the torture genius aspect of him. Um, depression was clearly part of his thing, but like, do you feel like this therapy and, uh, something like an, an accident like that could have actually had an impact on him long term, like a closed head injury or, or do you feel like it was just kind of him from the beginning? I, I think it's real convenient that he had this condition or this, <clears throat> this treatment happened to him right around the time kids his age were getting sent to Vietnam. Very wealthy family, too. You've got an interesting point there. I think it's very, very convenient. Uh, they, somebody who'd been to a mental hospital wouldn't be allowed to serve. Yeah, no, I, I have never even thought of that before. Um, but I think, I think you're absolutely right. The, uh, it, it was no stranger. And that's, that's an that's a ancient, going back all, like as, as far back as there's been wars, there's been wealthy families getting their kids out of... Uh, and once again, people like, did you know that he was from a super affluent family? Yeah. 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 Um, be here to love me. kind of goes over it a lot. Um, like just where he came from. Yeah. They don't, they kind of touch on it. They don't really go into it a lot, but his, his father or his grandfathers were like, like they, uh, were like founding members, like founding 
Like they have counties and stuff named after them. Yeah, I read something about like the Van Zant County or something. Yeah, and uh, like maybe an oil family. I'm not. I'm not exactly. Yeah, sure. I don't know what it was. I think it, it might have been oil or something. Yeah, he he works. His dad worked for. I just kind of assume automatically. I'm like, oh, rich Texas person must be oil. Like, but uh, yeah. I mean, there's got to be other other aspects of it. Yeah, no, yeah. there's uh, definitely. I think it was oil. Yeah, uh, one of the things that I, I found interesting about the guy, uh, not interesting in a in a uh, like a happy fun way, but. Um, he was one of these guys that just like Jim Morrison or uh, I mean, there's there's const, constant cases of this where someone's struggling with substance. And um, and then when they die, people are like like Kurt Cobain is another example that immediately pops to mind. People are like, uh, well, he died under really suspicious circumstances and it involved like a, a family member, or a spouse or a friend or a colleague or whatever, because his uh, his wife i think his ex-wife like checked him out of the hospital and the doctors like do not take him home he's not fit to look after himself and then uh he was trying to detox but at the same time he was like having serious health problems like like all kinds of heart issues his wife's like oh he'll be fine took him home and like days later he was dead of uh some kind of heart failure and uh so people immediately kind of get to this like why was his ex-wife checking him out and and who's going to get all the money from the royalties and 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 would he have lived if he'd stayed in the hospital and and uh and that's that's a whole bunch of ifs and and you know so it's hard to say but um it's a sad ending to a really really fascinating case and i would i and like i know uh a lot of people are familiar with kind of the the i don't want to say mainstream necessarily because even the mainstream hits not really all super well known but uh poncho and lefty is like one that kind of pops to mind but the guy's incredible. Like every every time I I listen to one song, it branches off into another one, and I'm like, man, like it's just no shortage of uh, incredible material from the guy. Yeah. Yeah, he was great. He was a great songwriter for sure. Yeah. Um, just to touch on that whole thing with his wife, I think <clears throat> she claims that he begged her to take him out, and because of his experiences in having those treatments, right, that he would never go to a hospital. I know people from Winnipeg. When he played the Winnipeg Folk Festival, oh, he did I, it twice, and uh, they knew him, and he burnt himself in a hotel room because he's drunk. Right. And uh, he refused to go to a hospital here. He had to fly back to Nashville to go to a hospital. When was it? Would have been like that. The, was, it was either eighty-seven or ninety-three. I was going to say because wow. he he that would have been right before he died if it was in ninety-three. Like, ninety-three. Uh, he died in ninety-seven. New Year's. Ninety-seven. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Holy! I had no idea he played at the. Uh... He played Edmonton too. Wow! Yeah, him and Guy. That's incredible, huh? Man, and that's only uh, that's not even that long ago. Like I know ninety seven. Those guys love Canada. Yeah, like, they they were treated like royalty up here. So, like Steve Earle, his biggest concert that he ever put on in his whole career was at the Saddle Dome. Yeah, and I'm not surprised a lot of the Nashville guys make it up to Alberta, but um like there's there's a lot of tours from like like Garth Brooks did like nine shows in a row here yeah. or whatever and yeah. and, <laughs> and Alan Jackson is here quite often. But yeah. uh um and Zach Brown band a lot of, a lot of big uh acts but I'm surprised it made it all the way up to Manitoba. Not not to yeah. be hard on Manitoba oh, but no, like no. they're not the same kind of well, uh, but super it, rich it, country market. It is one of the the biggest festivals in Canada, the Winnipeg Folk Festival. The Winnipeg Folk Festival. It, it, even yeah. back then, it was it was. Uh, I think it was Sudbury had the biggest folk festival in Ontario, mm -hmm. and then I think the big three were Winnipeg, Calgary, and Edmonton. Oh man! So, and then there's Vancouver, of course. But Regina's starting to become more prominent. But at that time, it would have been those would have been the big three. Yeah, cool. That's super cool. Hey, Andrew. Yes, yes. What are we drinking? What are we drinking? We are drinking Jerkface 9000. Ooh, Jerkface 9000. From Parallel 49 Brewing. Yeah. And, uh, oh, what? It pairs really well with this can of Lucky over here. <laughs> <laughs> this is from Vancouver. I guess it's still Canadian, but uh, Charlie, you had one job. I said an Alberta beer. Look at this from BC. <laughs> you didn't tell me that. You just said, hey, uh, can you think, grab beer? I think I did, yeah. There's a little, uh, th first of all, this bottle is just winning awards. That's uh, right. I had to get it. Right off the top, it says, uh, right on the bottle here, it says, hey, you. Yeah, I'm talking to you, buddy. How about you grab a bottle of this mosaic hopped American wheat beer and cram it down your pie hole? Did I hurt your feelings? Too friggin' bad. When it's good, you ain't got to be nice about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that clown is just freaky. 
I this this clown. You know who this looks like? This looks like this. Uh, just bringing up just sad things left and right here. Oh. It looks like uh, the guy from Prodigy. Oh yeah, that doesn't is. that look like him? I get you. I get it. For What's sure. this? Keith Flint was his name? I think so. Yeah, the guy that He's just a real uh, fire starter just, just died. Yeah, same day as Luke Perry. How yeah. I don't know why these guys always die on the same day. Like, uh, yeah, that was another conversation we had one time about Johnny Cash. The day you found out he died. I had a, I was down in Montana the day I found out and my brother had texted me. He's like, you know, John Ritter also died. And I'm like, that's a bummer that John Ritter died because <laughs> no one's going to re- remember that. Uh, like Johnny Cash. I didn't realize. Oh, sure. But Jack Tripper though. I know. But like you die the same day as Johnny Cash and it doesn't matter. I mean, like I think the Queen of England could die on it's the a, same day a, as Johnny Cash. It's and, a tough and, act to follow. Yeah. 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 This trick face is not bad. It's all right. Pretty cool bottle. Did you buy it because of the bottle? Uh, sort of. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do judge my books by their covers. As a graphic designer, also. Charlie's just plugging his projects left and right I didn't here. Holy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I got another one to talk about here, man. But did you want to? I think I'll just close off with one thing about the Towns Van Zandt thing before we move on. Sure, man, absolutely. Right. Sure. I, I think a lot of people with, with Towns, they kind of go through that, you know, like you were saying, you just find another song and another song. And it oh, leads yeah. To, um, but as, as a songwriter and as somebody who does, who did, um, who tried my hand at, at the, uh, the tortured artist bit for a little while, I think it's really important to remember that he was he was just a dude, I guess, at the end of the day. I think Steve Earle put it really well. Right. He said that he joined a cult. When it came to towns, it was like a hero worship kind of thing. And I think a lot of people in that regard have. And what's scary about it is people go through these, it's almost like the stages of guilt, whatever, or no, of grief. Right. Mm, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah, totally. what are they? It's like five? Oh, we can, we'll, we'll plug that in. There is, there's five... And there's a great Simpsons episode about the stages of grief. <laughs> there's stages of grief, yeah. You can expect to go through five stages. The first is denial. No way, because I'm not dying. Second is anger. Why, you little... <laughs> after that comes fear. What's after fear? What's after fear? Bargaining. Doc, you gotta get me out of this. I'll make it worth your while. And finally, acceptance. Well, we all gotta go sometime. Mr. Simpson, your progress astounds me. There's, there's... Yeah, anyhow, I think, I think people go through that with, with towns. I think they get... They feel like they get angry. They get, you know, they get really bummed out about it. Denial. They, yeah, there's, yeah. Some, there's a, like, Bargaining. well, he wasn't that, he wasn't that. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm serious. I yeah. think it's, it's, you got to be really careful. Right. No, I, I can understand that. Yeah, absolutely. I know. And I'm probably doing it right now. I'm probably quoting somebody and I don't even know it, but I've, I've like talked to other songwriters uh, about this and, and just, you know, like, <clears throat> none of us were around. None of us uh, were there. Yeah. But we quote things from other people. I was having dinner with my friend, Ben, great songwriter from Brooklyn. And uh, our other friend, Scott, had brought up Towns. And then just off the cuff, Ben was like, you know, Towns... The thing about Towns is he didn't write any songs in the last 15 years of his life, maybe, maybe one or two. And that's a direct Steve Earle quote about Towns. And so this guy we're, we're so religious about, we're so very much, uh, like we follow him like Jesus. We can quote yeah. what, where he was, what he was doing. We don't know. We weren't there. But we, yeah. we feel like we were because we feel like we've lived these things. And I think it's really dangerous. It's really fucking dangerous. Mm-hmm. And you got to be careful because a lot of good people get hurt when you live that recklessly and when you live for a song instead of yourself. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's really important to remember. But Do you feel like in some way that his image was uh, like, like not just not just a result of his character and his depression, but actually part of like, this is my thing. This is what I do. This is what I have to stay in order to be a successful songwriter. Part of my thing is being like a, a tortured alcoholic. So I have to continue being a tortured alcoholic. 
Like, and I realize I'm asking your opinion. Well, here, you but see, like, exactly. Like I just said, I wasn't you know. there. But I mean, my opinion on that is: Have you ever met an alcoholic before? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, see, that's yeah, and we've we've kind of broached this subject a little bit before, but I feel like there are people. And I, I'm an alcoholic, so we tend to blame everybody except ourselves. Right. And so, I don't know. I'll just leave it with that. Like, dude was an alcoholic. Yeah. Yeah. Is it is a cautionary tale too, man? So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't. Want Sorry to get all heavy there. No, 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 no. That's good, man. This no, is a I good love it. platform <laughs> yeah, to say it. something about it because I love it, man. Go it's deep. Because yeah. there's there's a lot of like I said, there's a lot of us, a lot of us. Yeah. And like I said, Ben Ben's from Brooklyn. He lives in Nashville now, and uh, like a lot of like a lot of people are going that route, mm-hmm. and may, maybe not even like Ben's actually five months sober. And I know a lot of people are doing it the right way and being good people and not burning their bridges and not being complete assholes and just trying to get by on songs, which is, I didn't do that. Man, we're just getting by on songs. Like, uh, it's, I I know, I know the three of us can relate to it in, in, on different levels, but trying to make a living as a musician is an extremely difficult thing to do. Like it's really hard to pay the bills. And uh, like myself, I mean, on a monthly basis, I'm like, oh, I hope that I don't get fired from like something because I have a mortgage and kids and, and, and like, you know, like, yeah, and it's, it's the same. Like, I don't, Charlie, do you have the, in, in that regard, is there something that you feel about that? Like the pressure of like, you got to keep going, but at the same time, you've got this, like this musician stuff that you got to keep up oh, with at sure. the same time. For you know? sure. I, I get a balance. I get a balance musician stuff and then all the design stuff and running my own my mm-hmm. own business and all that on the side as well, right? So yeah. so it's a constant juggling act of keeping all the plates spinning and hoping that you can put new plates up Yeah, and hoping none of them crash down to the ground. And hoping if a good opportunity comes up, you just take it. Oh, you have to. And uh, have you guys seen that Ken Jeong uh, stand-up special on Netflix? I know I it's kind of a... I, I haven't yet. It's, no. it's, 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 an, uh, it's an interesting aspect of I'm not going to get too much into it, but he was a doctor before he became a comedian. Or he was, I guess he was a comedian his whole life or whatever, but he was, before he became like in the movies really involved, he was working as like a, uh, uh, emergency room doctor. And, uh, when he got the role in, um, uh, knocked up, I think it was, he like did his filming Judd Apatow's like, dude, you're so good. We're going to get in a bunch of movies here. And he went back to work the next day and he's like, I just can't do this anymore. I got to go. <laughs> That's a lot as a, as a young person, he would have been like maybe early thirties or whatever who had gone through all the stuff to be a doctor, was in a movie, was really good, and then the director was like, I'm going to get you in my stuff, and he's just like, okay, I'm going to quit being a doctor. Like, that's a huge thing. That, that would be... It's really switching gears. Yeah, that'd be like the previous, oh, 20 plus years of his life, easily. You know? Yeah. Like, oh, a lot to give up just to be a... Just to be a but guy for like, making people laugh. Not like just he, to take he, your pants off in front of everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and that was, it's incredible. It's actually, the funny thing was uh, he, he talks a lot about it, those movies and how that was like one of the most freeing moments of his yeah. life. He's yeah, like, he's, like, he's like, I love it, man. I'm, his I'm wife totally said cool it was going to be the feel-good movie of the summer. <laughs> every, every man was going to go home feeling a- adequate. You know? Yeah. But also, it's not like if he decides to stop making movies, he could, still, he could go back to being a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> like he still has the knowledge. And yeah, stuff. you could. He still has the the you know cert- certification. Isn't he playing a doctor again? Doesn't he have a show called Doctor? <laughs> he, was, he was in, do- he was in <laughs> Doctor. He just, just doctor Ken. Have a think. show about being yeah. a doctor. So one of the coolest things I've uh, I, I was I don't know I was about grade four and that movie La Bamba came out and I was like man this movie's just awesome I loved everything about it and uh, uh, this sounds like a strange kind of reference, but it just, I loved it. I love the movie and I love the soundtrack and uh, everything about it. I was like, this is just super cool. Um, and that led me into kind of, you know, developing an appreciation for the Big Bopper and for Buddy Holly. Um, there's a huge conspiracy over what happened on that plane. So the plane, yeah. the plane crashed and then in the wreckage, people were claiming that they found bullet holes in the wreckage. So they're like, somebody had a gun on board, the gun went off a couple times. And this, this has dogged that story for a really, really long time to the point that the big bopper, his, I don't know exactly what, and I'll, I'll include the link in the episode description, but the, um, he was exhumed and, uh, it wasn't for the, uh, the, the sake of disproving this conspiracy. For some reason, the land was, something was up and they had to move him. 
And they're like, well, let's take this chance to like prove this theory once and for all. While we're here. Yeah, while we're here. While we got the guy out, let's give him a quick, like, you know. Just a once over. Just a once over. <laughs> look at a quick look at his corpse. And uh, his son was actually there. So his son, who had never met him in person, got to see the body, uh, like look in the coffin and see the body, which is, that's got to be intense. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. Like, and this is decades later. Like, this is not that long ago. And then a doctor looked over and the doctor was like, yep, this totally... Uh, this was a plane crash. This 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 person died of like multiple fractures, like just totally smashed to pieces. Um, no bullet wounds, no signs of. Uh, although it would be hard to tell the signs of a struggle. Yeah, yeah. But uh, and then out of that, I was like, this this is incredible. And then people are like, yeah, like that's just the beginning of it. Because what I didn't know after learning about this was that. So Buddy Holly's bassist at the time was a young Waylon Jennings. Yep. And he was going to be the guy on... So there was the famous coin toss to yep. get the seat on the airplane. Yeah, well, they were eating hot dogs. And yeah. And, uh, and and so Buddy Holly's uh, bass player, Waylon Jennings, lost this coin toss. And uh, this guy was feeling real sick. And, and he made some joke about like, oh, I hope, you'd, I hope your, your bus crashes or whatever that Waylon Jennings was on. And Willie Jennings said something like, well, I hope your plane crashes. Yeah. <laughs> like just, just joking around just Whoops. between buds and then. Can't take yeah, that back. Then, yeah, no, can't take that back. But uh, <laughs> Waylon Jennings, an interesting case. And I don't know if he was racked with guilt per se, but uh, it's an interesting thing that, that someone. But think about it. You don't think that would weigh heavy on you for oh, a, quite a while? Way into your career. Sure. Absolutely. Sure. And, it's, and he could have played up that angle at, at every chance. And I don't mm -hmm. know if he did. But uh, I think the fact that it's a little bit like, did you guys both know about this already? Yeah, mm -hmm. I did, yeah. yeah. Like he could have, he could have really milked that cow for a lot. Anyways, here's here's a little bit of one of my favorite Wayne Jennings songs. Someday I'll get over you. I'll live to see it all through. But I'll always be dreaming my dreams with you. And someday I'll get over you. I'll live to see it all through. But I'll always miss dreaming my dreams with you. That's a good one. Yeah, it's a cool it's song. Nice little lullaby. I sing that to my daughter sometimes. Yeah. Well, did you want to... I mean, you can use my guitar if you want to, man. Um, yeah, it sounds great. I'll probably do that. I'll play something. Sure. <clears throat> I'll do a town song. Dude, man, that'd be awesome. I'll do my favorite town song. Sweet. Chained upon the face of 
time Feeling full of foolish rhyme There ain't no dark till something shines I'm bound to leave the start behind Great song, man. Yeah. That's a that sums up a dude's life in five verses. <laughs> yeah. Who else could do that? Two chords. Yeah, you know, I one of the things I I've in like I, I love the way that Towns Van Zandt would play, and one of the things I love about that uh, what's the movie again? What's it called again? The documentary. Be here to love me. Be here, to love me. Thank you. It's actually that scene you were talking about is from Heartworn Highway, so. It, they yeah, actually it, used that. They used that footage, and they didn't get permission from any of the people that owned Heartworn Highways. Oh, really? And so when they saw Be Here to Love Me, they're like, "What the hell? That's our movie!" Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I think it's a great movie anyway. But I, I, yeah, <laughs> they were very unhappy about that. Apparently. Yeah, I think I think the estate has had a lot of issues with that. Um, yeah, it's a big mess. Yeah, it's a huge mess. And that's one of those things that kind of accompanies uh, the life of an alcoholic, right? Like uh, not crossing your T's and dotting your I's. And he, was, he was a human being at the, at the end of the day, right? And he's going to have yeah. those brief windows. And that's just it. The reason you're hearing the concert footage of uh, like live in Amsterdam is because he was having a good night. So yeah. He's like, that sounds great. Well, also let's, his, let's put his it out. road manager and manager, they were brothers. They were, those guys were snakes too. Um, so they recorded every night. Trying to make a living, man. You know, like, every night. Yeah, and you know, Towns did it because he wanted to hear back and see if he could, you know, like that's what Waylon Jennings did too. He recorded every night. Yep, absolutely. So, so him and the band could listen back, and so Towns did the same thing, but now, like you said, the estate's all a mess, and everybody's trying to get their hands on all of those tapes and make as much money as possible, <laughs> whipping a dead horse, which is really too bad. It is too bad. The weird thing that I don't like about some of those recordings is they'll get re-released with like weird overdubs and stuff like that. Yeah, which yeah. is a serious problem. And yeah, uh, I, yeah, man, I don't really want to. But that's been going it. on, you know, for yeah. years in that's Nashville. A, ugh. Uh, what's his name? That the kid does uh, Cocaine and Rhinestones podcast. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, David Allen Coe's kid. Is that David Allen Coe's kid? It is. Yeah, I knew did, that. Did, you did told you me about that this summer, and I was yeah. like, it's the, it's the greatest. It's awesome. Oh, it's a great podcast. I yeah. love it. I didn't and know Everybody it was... in my band loves it. Oh, they're just man. Like, they're yeah. like, if only he produced it and didn't talk at all, we'd be fine. <laughs> everybody hates his voice, right? He's, I, I don't mind his voice, man. Yeah. I hope he hears this. <laughs> <laughs> he hates Canadians, hey? What? Yeah, he hates Canadians. How can he hate Can- What? <laughs> yeah. yeah he's, he actually said that in, uh, in one of his interviews where he's like, Fuck Canada, you know? Oh. Like, and I'm just like... <laughs> so, yeah. I, and I don't like him because... Yeah, that's not cool. He, he defends his dad. Um, he's like, oh, my dad wasn't racist. He just released a bunch of, like, X-rated stuff, dropping the N-word and a bunch of, like, Ugh. misogynistic bullshit. Yeah. And then he defends his dad with that episode, that Merle Haggard episode, where he's, like, he's like bringing up satire. And it's, oh, it's so stupid. Uh, man. This is how I start feuds. Over podcasts. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm ready to. I'm, I'm ready to go back and because, check this out because that's uh, that, it's such bullshit. It's different. Merle Haggard, satire for sure. Like Oki from Muskogee and all yeah, that. Absolutely, satire dripping with satire. But have you heard those X-rated David Allen Co. tapes? I haven't, man. The only song I know is he the made one. them so he could sell them to his biker friend. Yeah, but it's it's I can't even I can't do it. You don't want to get into it, yeah? Yeah, no. it's. But I, I do want to say though, in another podcast that Chris Shiflet. Walking the floor, he interviews Tyler, the guy who does cocaine and rhinestones, and that's when he says it. He defends. He just casually slips it in there. Yeah, my dad did the same thing, you know, Ugh. referring to the Merle Haggard thing. And I'm just yeah. like, I knew it. I knew that's what you were setting up the whole time. I knew it. Bullshit. Yeah, yeah. I love Canada. <laughs> yeah, man. How can you not? <laughs> What's not to love? He, Charlie, do you love Canada? He doesn't like the, the most stereotypically nice people on the planet. <laughs> Apparently there was like an incident. Like maybe he got arrested and thrown out or something. Well, it's got to be something like that. Yeah. But They're whatever. not all real nice. 
No. <laughs> no, we're not. No, we're man. not. Well, that's for sure. Anyhow. Um, you were talking about this Mad Trapper song. <clears throat> uh, yeah. And I'd, I'd love to hear, even if it's just the story behind it. Do you want yeah, to, well. Another jerk face? Uh, I'm going to have another lucky. I'm still working on this sure. one, but uh, I might I'll have take one another jerk still. face if yeah. that's cool. For me. Do we got um, the opener? Yeah, because I, I, I'm a fan of this podcast. Right on, man. And I'm, and I'm ashamed to say I've only listened to three episodes. I you keep sending me shame the new, on you. I know you keep sending me the new ones, and then I, and then I get like you know moved to a new house with no internet, and I can't listen or download download anything. But um, yeah, well, I'm just glad you're here, and I'm glad you I'm glad you're liking it, man. That's good. I just want you guys to know that I am a fan. That's why. I'm hey, here. we got one. We got one. I'm probably <laughs> my mom and Richard. <laughs> we got two. I'm, oh, I'm yeah. probably your biggest fan because you know I'm I'm six five and four hundred pounds. <laughs> Anyhow, that was my one joke for the day. Oh, it's too bad because I got to play the show later too. Oh, dude, yeah. Um, yeah, Mad Trapper. That's a conspiracy for you. I I was just talking to to uh, a couple guys in Red Deer. I uh, stayed with my buddy Marcus Summer. Um, he just released an album. I'm plugging it right now. It's yeah, called man. True Sounds of the West. Is it where's it available? All of the streaming places. We can stick and, up a link, uh, yeah. I've, I've seen this. I've fallen. Yeah, there's also yeah. a... <clears throat> I think the album's coming out March 18th. Cool. Oh, sweet. That'll but, be... Uh, like, oh, yeah. So, yeah, you should really check that, that out. We were... Uh, we went down to... You know Dave Gilmore? Gilmore Guitars? Red Deer, yeah. Yeah, we went down to his shop. Not the Pink Floyd guy. <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know Dave Gilmore? <laughs> <laughs> he lives in Red Deer. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a great guitar shop. The guy happens to be, I think it's spelled differently. It's yeah, I think name. so, yeah. 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 And, and he goes by David, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. David Gilmore, yeah. yeah. I just said Dave Gilmore because I, I, sorry. Sorry to all you Pink, Pink Floyd, is that? <laughs> it's Pink Floyd, yeah. Yeah, I, was, I'm so, I, I've, I don't know anything about rock and roll. Yeah, Perked all their ears up for a second. <laughs> we, were, uh, we went down to his shop and uh, we were swapping songs. And we this this song came up, and uh, I didn't know, but the guy sitting across from us, he was playing guitar, real casual, and, uh, just happened to be an RCMP officer, and I was like, oh yeah, this uh, this guy, the Mad Trapper, it was the longest manhunt in Canadian history, and he's like, oh yeah, I heard that, didn't he kill an RCMP officer? I was like, looked at him. Straight in the eye, I was like, he killed four. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, kind of like, you know. Like, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, he's like, oh, yeah. He's like, there's in the museum, the RCMP museum in Regina, there's, they, have, they have a couple of his guns. They have his coat riddled, riddled with bullet holes. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, I was like, oh, I'm going to check that out. I usually, I usually steer clear of the RCMP. And then everybody starts laughing in the room. And the guy's looking at me. He's like. I'm an RCMP officer. I was like, oh, I'm glad I shut up. You know, I was, I was about to like get all gung ho there. And then, no, that guy's super nice though. So. Right on. And uh, hangs out with a lot of musicians. So, which is why he was there. But yeah, no, we got into talking about it. And uh, it was bizarre. Nobody knows who this guy was. Nobody knows uh, where he came from, what he did. He had... Over two grand U.S. currency on them. And it's like $5,000 Canadian? Yeah, but this is 1927. <laughs> yeah. So that's a lot of money. I don't know the exact number, what it'd be. But he was, uh, he was hunted down. I think it took 40 days, 38 to 40 days. In the middle of like January, February, cold snap in the Yukon. They called in a pilot from Edmonton a World War I veteran pilot who went by the name of Wap May. <laughs> and uh, he claimed to be like an ace, but it turned out he only shot down like five people. He was like, oh, I'm almost as good as Billy Bishop. He, he, was getting, <laughs> he was literally drinking his life away in a yeah. bar in Edmonton. <laughs> and so they hired him, and it was a big media circus, and, uh, and it took them like 38 or 40 days to, to finally catch him. And when they shot him, they shot him like 39 times or something like that. Oh man. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was bizarre because the whole thing, uh, 
I was talking to a friend about this the other day. It just doesn't add up <laughs> because the, uh, the RCMP got a report that he had been messing around with some Indians' uh, trap line. This is the Mad Trapper you're talking about? Yeah, they, they got a report that the Mad Trapper, Albert Johnson, as he was known, was uh, messing around with, the, with these guys' trap lines. That just doesn't add up. Knowing Canadian history, I don't think I would get a dog sled team go out, you know, 23 hours out of my way or whatever it was to where his cabin was to investigate the report of, you know, like, let's, let's be honest here about Canadian history for a second. Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> it just doesn't add up. But in the end, I, I think this dude just wanted to be left alone, and I think they should have left him alone. Mm. It's my personal opinion, but... So what, what was he, like, aside from the trap lines, like, what, what was he accused of doing that they were like, there's this massive manhunt for the guy? It was just the trap lines? Well, no. Like, there's some native <laughs> that's families? That's what kicked it off. Right, okay. Was, okay. That's what the initial investigation was. They, they decided they were going to go out there and look and see what was going on. He wouldn't come to the door. He right. basically told him to fuck off. Yeah. And not come back. Well... I think it was, uh, it was probably the first time they, were, they said they were going to come in forcibly. And he said, no, you're not. And so he shot an officer through the door. And then the other officer loaded him up, took him back. They come back with four more guys. And uh, another gunfight happens. I think an officer was killed that time around. Yeah. The other guy was still fine. Or, well, he was still alive. And uh, so they get some dynamite. They try to blow up his cabin while he's in it. The dude had it worked out so that once it collapsed inward, it just reinforced a bunker. Like, so he could still shoot out. He had supplies on the inside. He had so much ammo. And then when <clears throat> they left again, he took off. And that's when the manhunt started. Right. He had weapons caches. Or ammo, anyway. And food. All over the place. Hidden everywhere. Yeah. And he, that's how he stayed alive. And we're not talking like downtown, Edmonton, big city. We're talking barren, Yukon. Arctic wasteland. Yeah. yeah. Like the tundra. Yeah. yeah. And he, he went, he like, at one point, he was in a caribou herd for a few days. And then he'd walk backwards or put his snowshoes on backwards. And that's, I don't know if you've ever done that, but that's pretty difficult. <laughs> Yeah. It's hard enough walking him in yeah. right side up. Oh, man. Exactly. Yeah. And so he was, uh, you know, he was a, he was a wild man. Like they, and they couldn't catch him. You know, they had Indian trappers. They had that guy with the plane circling above. They couldn't, they just couldn't get him. And uh, when they finally decided they had him, he ended up climbing the face of a mountain <laughs> and getting over the other side. <laughs> no problem. Right. And they were worried he was going to make it to Alaska. They are like... I think he, the closest he got to Alaska was something like 70 or 80 miles. But like from where he started in the Yukon, like he had covered so much ground. And uh, January to February in, yeah. the, in the Yukon in the in, 1920s. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's hard for, if, if, you've, if you've ever been up in the Yukon, Charlie and I, we, we did a, I guess it was, a, it was Yellowknife. S Snow King The Snow King Festival. Festival oh, yeah. In, in March. And it was bitterly cold. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Horrific, and there was central heating and stuff like that. It was terrible, so but like it was, yeah. I guy, can't imagine 1920s. Yeah, he knew what years he was, earlier. Yeah, knew what he was doing. Uh, the other interesting thing is these officers were all World War One veterans. They had all served in the Great War. They had all killed people before. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a CBC audio documentary. And I think everybody should go listen to that. I don't know where it is. I, I think I found it on YouTube years ago. I'll track down it. But yeah, there's a, yeah, there's, they interview uh, one of the officers and he was a sniper. And I think he was the first one that shot him. <laughs> he said he was scrambling up a river bank. He shot him into his pack and he had like pots and pans and whatnot. And he said he rolled in, fell backwards into the river. It was frozen. And he said he popped up so fast, slung his rifle up. And shot him through the shoulder while he had his scope on him and he, he had just shot him and as he like and he just popped up that fast he's like i've never seen anything like that in my life yeah he's like what is it like what what who is this guy yeah and so they eventually they got him in a crossfire and they filled him full of bullets yeah but uh 
Like that, it's just like they were all veterans, and and the sniper, and Canadian snipers were particularly good. The fact that this guy outran them for so long. During the autopsy, they found out he had club foot, like one foot was bigger than the other. They, they don't know who he was. They don't know if Albert Johnson was actually his name. That's just what everybody called him. It. And then they found all that cash on him. You know, like uh, an American cash too. That's yeah, really sure. suspicious. So there was. There, so is that Alaskan cash? Yeah. Like, is he even from like Skagway, Gatineau, or something like that? Yeah. Or who knows? And and people have speculated that he was some sort of like, maybe he was like an early black ops type of guy. You know, like messed up from the war, obviously. You, I mean, if you're if you have that kind of training, those kind of reactions, that just doesn't happen. No, that's no. not. That's not. I've been I've been messing with people's traps out in the like panning in the yeah in the closet well, and he had caches you know he had caches of, of food and ammunition like that sounds like a military uh no totally and and his his yeah his cabin turned into a like a bunker when they tried to blow it up yeah like he was he was clearly like deranged but leave the guy alone <laughs> that's really <laughs> fascinating so and this this guy that the main title of the of the theory is like the mad trapper yeah the mad trapper of the rat rivers there were several books i read on the subject growing up my dad had one, and that one's more of a, a fictional kind of what was going through everybody's head account. But there's, there's other books that were, that were more better. I can't remember which, which ones they were, but there were several that I read. Yeah. So it always fascinated me. I have a band called The Mad Trappers in Winnipeg. I've, yeah, I was just going to ask about that. Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, I, and I knew that. And I love that picture of you guys. Like, you're sitting in the chair, and the guys are all up beside you, and mm. just just looks awesome. And... Uh, I always assumed, and uh, this is this is a bad assumption, but I always assumed it was a native guy that was the that was the trapper. Like I'd heard no. of the I'd heard of the indigenous angle, yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I had always assumed it was like this native guy that the RCMP had been been tracking down. And oh, there there are stories like that too. Yeah. I, I got I got a few. I of they those all get too. mixed up, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But those those all happen out in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Have you ever been up in the territory? No, you never, never been to Yellowknife. Everybody tells me I got to go up to Dawson. I got to yell. Yeah, it was up, it's oh, up you got to go to the Snow King, man. Up in Whitehorse a couple of months ago. It was pretty uh, great. Uh, isn't that nice? Yeah, Come I man. guess so. Yeah. <laughs> well, you got another song for us, man? Yeah, I could do another song. Sure. Um, just to, you know, disclaimer. I'm not anti-law, if anybody's <laughs> wondering. I uh, started the band about five or six years ago. A little more teen angst going on then. But I'm not anti-law, so I hope you know that. Anyway, I'm going to play a different You're pro-law. I am. I, I appreciate that there's people out there trying to uphold. They got tough jobs. Yeah. They do. They got to make tough calls. Yeah. 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 Snap decisions. Leave with, me uh, alone. With, with it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of the best thing. Let's go where it's needed. Yeah. Hmm. I kind of want to do a song that... You can do whatever you like, man. We can we can shoehorn it in however we like. Northern Rocky Peaks for 
hills where we lay Let my buckskin stallion wander free For he has earned the right to live his days in peace And empty the last cartridge from my gun A piece of wood and iron A stolen many good man's son May redemption Still be found For me Kind of younger man Would not receive Cowboy song. Have you ever been to the Crow's Nest Pass before? Yeah, I my family, uh, my grandparents had a farm in Hill Spring. Hill Spring, which is just east of Twin yeah. Butte. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I grew. I, our summers were all there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I love that place. I did I, too. We were driving through there, and then I got the idea for that song. It was like. Uh, I don't know, Corbett just put out that uh, Cabin Fever record. Yeah. And I was reading an interview where he was talking about how the last song on that album, he's like, it's basically just a Louis L'Amour book. And, uh, or something like that. It's like, oh, I could do that. <laughs> I kind of got the idea. I was like, and, uh, and, then I, and then I did. Wrote that song. And that was, yeah, it's been, I, I really like playing that one still. Because... I, I don't know. I just, I love that part of the country so much yeah, that it's like, too. I just, I bring myself to that spot, you know, that, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. It's unreal. And the history there in the Crow's Nest Pass is, uh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to, we're, we're going to talk about it at some point of the Frank slide is, yeah. uh, and, uh, when I was in university, there was the hundredth uh, anniversary of the Frank slide. Uh, and, uh, there was an article about it and, um, what, what year was it? I want to say 1905. Yeah. Okay. Something like that. Yeah, I, I could that, be wrong, but, sounds, but somewhere around that there. That sounds right. And uh, over the years, um, everyone from Farley Mowat to uh, James Cameron had talked about doing like books and movies and all this stuff. And uh, and that's just one little tiny story about the about yeah. the business past. Uh, yeah, totally. Fascinating, uh, haunted, just ghosts all over the place. Yeah. And uh, I've 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 taught out there. I've There's, lived uh, lived out there. I've played out there. It's Wow. There's a bunch of gold down there, but everybody's too scared to try and get it. Lost lemon mine, man. That's the theory we're going to talk about, and that's a that's a bit of a, a sizzle. But that's a that's a fascinating theory. Holy, have you ever heard of the lost lemon mine? Nope. Oh, Charlie, Charlie, who went looking for the Yogo Pogo as a youngster. 
Did you? Sure, sure. yeah. I, I was I, out there. <laughs> Have you been there too? Well, no, I, but I'm, I'm cryptozoology is like a, just my. It's a hobby of mine, you know. A hobby. Oh yeah. You're. Oh, yeah. A, I got. I got cameras and shit. I go out there and just like. I'm like that idiot Bobo with two sticks. Oh, it's a juvenile squatch. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, that's a juvenile squatch. Can you hear him? I can't believe we're just getting into this now, man. You're a, you're an amateur cryptozoologist. Yeah, yeah. When by amateur, it's like I got a bottle of whiskey. It's in the middle of the night. <laughs> Ryan is like, Richard, put your pants on. <laughs> Have you no shame? That's what most of those shows are, though, aren't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Basically. Wow. <laughs> Basically. Oh. Cryptozoology, man. It's Hats weird. off to Bobo for making a career of being just a dummy. <laughs> <laughs> uh. But yeah, man. Well, uh, thanks for thanks for being here with us, man. This is really cool. I'm glad we got to talk about some stuff here. Yeah. Well, thanks yeah. for having me. I'll oh. come back anytime. We can talk about Bigfoot. Now that I know that, like that you're a, a cryptozoologist, we haven't, that we haven't. No. And there's uh, yeah, there's a couple. There's the ape man. Oh, we'll get into that. There's Charlie's favorite, the crocodile man. Oh, crocodile man. Yeah. Or the, yeah. the alligator half alligator guy. Man. I don't know. I don't want to say is he a crocodile or an yeah, alligator. Yeah, it's like I saw Suicide Squad. It's real. <laughs> <laughs> it's killer croc. Yeah. Um, you can find us on It's a Conspiracy podcast at Instagram and uh, It's a Conspiracy at Proton Mail if you want to email us. Our pod, our Twitter is uh, is it a conspiracy and uh, our Patreon, Patreon. is patreon.com right. slash it's a conspiracy um, and if, listen to free if if you want to you don't have to throw in money but if you want to that's but cool if too. you do that's pretty cool um, Richard where can we uh, check you out online I've got a Bandcamp page and they take a bunch of money so you can buy the album on I think Google Play iTunes and it's on Spotify and all that stuff and what's it called. Uh, I've just, it's just a self-titled album up there right now. I'm getting I'm actually working with a manager to get all my back catalog put up there. Cool. And because I, I I've got a bunch of other stuff too. And I had an album that was supposed to come out last fall. Didn't. Probably won't. Might release it as singles. Keep that sweet dollar bills rolling in. Okay. So, <laughs> well, what we'll do is we'll I'll track down what I can and we'll talk about it later. Yeah, and grab I got, some, I got some like live videos yeah. on, on YouTube. Like my friend Louise, uh, she does. She does this thing called Drop Pictures, and she does a bunch of different artists, so check that out, too. Absolutely. Uh, thanks so much to Acoustic Music on, uh, on White Ave in Edmonton. They have uh, lent us their acoustic room, and uh, it's been pretty cool. There have been some people outside uh, the window here looking in at what we're doing, and it's been, it's been really cool. So thanks for giving us this space. And uh, Jerkface 9000. Jerkface hey. 9000. Good stuff. Wow. <laughs> All right, well, thanks again, and uh, we'll see you for our... Uh, this will come out just before our St. Patty special, so uh, we'll see you on the St. Patty special. See you on the other side. Bye. Felt it coming long before They ever closed your casket door You felt it in the whispering pine On the trail where you set your line Winter's long and winter's cold you always knew you'd never grow old And I doubt you kissed your love goodbye Baby, that's the reason why If it's time to die, hell Ain't got nothing to do today Anyhow Anyhow Far above the borderline in the depths of winter time You built your fortress on the banks Waiting for the coming storm The come with dogs and guns and planes You've seen worse, you ain't afraid Your laugh still haunts beyond the grave And if it's time to die, hell Ain't got nothing to do today Anyhow Climb the mountain tall and wide Among the caribou you hide Backward footprints down below Left a trail of dead man in the snow 
world is full enough, you say Only gotta get away and leave me, babe Is all you asked of me If it's time to die, hell Ain't got nothing to do today, anyhow Anyhow You almost made the Alaska line Freedom's calling you this time You must have known the whole damn while Freedom's worth the 80 miles So let the river wash away Bloody spot where you did lay And if it's time to die, hell I ain't got nothing to do 